As we begin our brand new study in 2 Samuel today, it would be hard for us to understand everything that is going to happen in the first couple of chapters as David becomes the king of Israel if we don't go back and look at uh, the ending of 1 Samuel. If you remember, the book of 1 Samuel introduced us to Samuel the prophet as a child and then how he brought in King Saul to be the king. The story of 1 Samuel is basically about King Saul and then his relationship with a young boy by the name of David who is going to become king after him. 2 Samuel is about the life of King David from the time he becomes king all the way through until he resigns at the end uh, and at the beginning of 1 Kings by the way to allow Solomon to become the next king. So we need to kind of go back and uh, catch just an introduction to the end of 1 Samuel before we go on so that we can understand chapter 1 of 2 Samuel. As 2 Samuel opens, the story continues from the end of 1 Samuel. David and his 600 men had followed, get this, the Philistine king of Gath up to Mount Gilboa where they would back up the Philistines in their fight against, now catch this, the Israelites. And so David and his men are going to be there to be behind and fight with the Philistines. Now the other four Philistine kings, not the king of Gath, but the uh, kings of the other four major cities, did not trust David to be in the rear of the Philistine army because they felt like they'd come and fight against them from the rear. And they made the king of Gath send David and his men back home. David and his men left Mount Gilboa on the morning of the battle against King Saul. David did not know what was going to happen in that battle that morning because he's on his way home. David was at least three days from his home, perhaps four days. And on the first day of his journey home, King Saul was killed by the Philistines. Catch this, David did not know that that had happened. When David and his men arrived back in their village called Ziklag, which had the village of Ziklag had been given to him by the king of Gath to be his own village, they found that village plundered. But they also realized that their wives and children were not dead in the village. And because of that, they pretty well knew that they had been taken as spoils and had been taken alive. So after the three to four day journey back from Gilboa back to Ziglag, exhausted, David and his men immediately pressed on 20 more miles that day into the Philistine area, we would call it the Gaza Strip, to the Brook Bezer. They had no fears in this journey into the Gaza Strip area because all the Philistine warriors were at, at least 80 miles away at Gilboa. Now worn out when they arrived at the Brook Bezer, 200 of David's men were too exhausted to continue. But David and 400 men were ready to push on to go find their families. And so 200 of the men stayed behind to guard the baggage and all that they had carried. Because you remember when you went on a trip like this up to Mount Gilboa, you had to take your food, you had to take your sleeping bags, your sleeping stuff, you had to take your tents, you had to take everything with you for the journey. There were no really places to stop and buy anything at all on the way. So pressing on, David came by chance across an Egyptian man who knew the whole story of what happened at Ziglag. He was there looting with the Amalekites. But now David has found him and he is separated from the Amalekites uh, a few days before and he knew exactly where they were. So he told David and David caught up with them and retrieved the families and all of their possessions. In addition, <laughs> they looted the spoils of the looters who had looted them. As 2 Samuel opens, David, his men, and their families have arrived back in their hometown of Ziglag and are there for three days before the news comes that King Saul is dead. 1 Samuel told us the life 
stories of three central characters that I've already mentioned. First Samuel the prophet, then Saul, and it introduced us to David. Saul disobeyed the Lord, and David, as a youth, was chosen to be the next king in Saul's place. And with Saul dead for more than a week now, it was time for David to be notified, crowned the new king, and take the throne. Now before we begin, let us remember how this book is recorded from what we learned in 1 Samuel because it's being recorded exactly the same way. The book of 1 Samuel as well as 2 Samuel is a compilation of chronicles that were written down by Samuel, Gad, and Nathan. Now Samuel is dead now by the time that 2 Samuel comes around, so it's just 2 Samuel is just by Gad and Nathan and their chronicles, but Samuel was part of the first uh, Samuel uh, issue when he wrote about his life in the chapters 1 through 7. And they recorded the events that, were, that happened in the kingly lines of Israel during their lives. Now Samuel recorded the first seven chapters of 1 Samuel about his early life. Doesn't mention his own name, that's how we know he wrote it. Gad picked up the pen and recorded most of the rule of King Saul until David comes along. And when David runs from Saul in Saul's fury, at that time Gad continues with David on the run from Saul and Nathan, a student of Gad, from the prophet uh, school of prophecy that Samuel had started, Nathan stayed with Saul and recorded his actions until Saul's death. So we have Gad with David, Nathan with Saul. After David becomes king, Gad and Nathan both continue to chronicle the king's activities. And it's very easy to understand who is doing the writing because neither prophet mentions themselves in their chronicles. If you hear the name Gad, 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 you know Nathan is writing it. If you hear the word Nathan, 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 you know Gad is writing it. Now Gad will stay with David until he becomes the total king of all the 12 tribes of Israel. Nathan will stay with the 11 northern tribes that did not immediately transfer to David. And once David becomes the king of all Israel, Gad will kind of fade away into the background recording everything that's going on, but Nathan will be ever present in the life of David. Nathan will continue to chronicle the deeds of the kings well into Solomon's reign after David resigns to allow Solomon to be the king in his place. From the first chapter of 1 Kings, it is evident that David lived at least two to three years into the reign of Solomon. Nathan was there to record the details. Gad was there to record the details. Second Samuel can be broken down. Uh, our study today can be, starting today, can be broken down into three segments. There are David's throne, David's triumph, and David's trouble. Now, I want you to understand these three sections are not in exact chronological order. David's throne speaks of his reign as king from the very get-go when he's crowned all the way until he's, uh, he is sick on his bed. The whole reign tells us how long he reigned as king on his throne in that section. The next section I call David's triumph, and it speaks of his victories as king, and it speaks of the victories that David had over all the enemies of Israel from the time he becomes king until he stops being king at the end of 2 Samuel. And finally, beginning in chapter 11 and going through chapter 24, that is a section about David's trouble. And it speaks of his struggles as king when he's in trouble. Now, you will notice as we are studying about this that each section starts with summaries spanning this and that that happens. In fact, each section kind of starts with a summary of the entire span of each of those three sections. And the three overlay on top of each other at the same time. But in the course of his life, uh, David deals with his throne, his triumphs, and his 
troubles. Now, his troubles actually began not at the beginning of his reign, but in his in his eighth year of his reign, and we will see that when we get to that section. So as we begin our study of David's life as king of Israel, with his turbulent beginning as king and the establishment of his throne over Israel, here we come to chapter 1, David's throne. As our first stop in the story of David's throne begins with the death in the kingdom and the discouraging report that comes to David. We start with chapter 1, verse number 1. Now it came about after the death of Saul, when David had returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, that David remained two days in Ziglag. And on the third day, behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul, with his clothes torn and dust on his head. And it came about that when he came to David, that he fell to the ground and prostrated himself. And then David said to him, From where do you come? And he said to him, I have escaped from the camp of Israel. And David said to him, How did things go? Please tell me. And he said, The people have fled from the battle, and also many of the people have fallen and are dead. And Saul and Jonathan, his son, are dead also. So David said to the young man who told him, how do you know that Saul and his son Jonathan are dead? The young man who told him said, By chance I happened to be on Mount Gilboa, and behold, Saul was leaning on his spear. And behold, the chariots and the horsemen pursued him closely. And when he looked behind him, he saw me and he called me. And I said, Here am I. And he said to me, Who are you? And I said to him, I am an Amalekite. And then he said to me, Please stand beside me and kill me, for agony has seized me because my life still lingers in me. So I stood beside him and killed him because I knew that he could not live after he had fallen. And I took the crown which was on his head and the bracelet which was on his arm, and I have brought them here to my Lord. First, this Amalekite had the same distance to travel to David's village as David did when he was sent away from Gilboa by the Philistine leaders. It was no less than a three-day journey. Probably four is more likely. But in the context of the stories told in 1 Samuel by the Chronicles of Gad and Nathan, David was at least a week away from his departure from Gilboa and maybe a few more days after that. Now this timing means that David had already rescued the families and spoils taken by the Amalekite tribe while this messenger was on his way to David from Gilboa back to Ziglag. It means that David and his families and soldiers had been settled back in Ziglag when that sole Amalekite left Gilboa. So we have to ask, why was he so late in leaving Gilboa? How did he conclude that he should take the crown and the bracelet back to David? Now we must remember that the Amalekites were enemies of Israel and King Saul was instructed to totally destroy every last one of the Amalekites. It was the reason Saul's sons would never sit on his throne, because he disobeyed the Lord by not destroying the Amalekites. Had he had destroyed the Amalekites, that Amalekite would not have been there to bring back the crown. Second, the story of this Amalekite that he has told to David cannot be faithful unless Saul after falling on his sword or on his spear, whichever it was, in order to commit suicide was actually still lingering in death. Now, when Saul committed suicide with his sword or his spear, his armor bearer, who would not kill Saul upon his request, killed himself and committed suicide. So this Amalekite was... Not Saul's armor bearer, but if the Amalekite did come upon Saul, still lingering, uh, Saul might have asked this Amalekite to finish him off like he did his armor bearer. 
So the Amalekites' testimony to David is either true or it is a lie. We would like to say that it was a lie based on the record in 1 Samuel that Samuel fell on his own spear or sword and died. But the prophet Nathan was with Saul on this journey and he chronicled the daily life of Saul. Gad was down with David. So as we prove these two points in first, the first Samuel study, we must ask the question, why did Nathan not record for us the arrival of this Amalekite to finish Saul in death? The answer may be that Nathan fled for his life once Nathan saw that Saul had fallen on either his sword or his spear. The young Nathan could not have stayed in the vicinity very long or the Philistines would have killed him too. But the Amalekite was different. <clears throat> you see, the Amalekites and the Philistines were neighbors and they did not find each other to be a threat. The Amalekite could have picked up the crown of Saul and the bracelet of Saul before the Philistines found Saul dead. Now we, don't, we do not know who actually mortally wounded Saul, a, a Philistine for sure he did, but Nathan's chronicle that the Philistines moved in, they moved in battle quickly, so quickly that they did not notice that Saul was dead until the campaign was over and they came back to survey the dead. That came to us out of the end of 1 Samuel. So no doubt the Amalekite had been near the death of King Saul because he was delivering Saul's crown and bracelet to David. The Philistines took the head and the sword of Saul as a national treasure. Now I want you to understand this. Indeed, had he still had his crown and bracelet with him in death, the Philistines would have identified him and they would have taken that crown and bracelet also as national treasures. This Amalekite must have taken them before the Philistines retraced their warpath and found Saul. Nathan did not tell us what happened to the crown and bracelet over in 1 Samuel. But Gad is now telling us in 2 Samuel. Now this story of the Amalekite may have been confirmed after all, and Gad discovered his actions simultaneously with David and wrote down what this Amalekite said because Gad was with David. Nathan was still in the north with the Israelites, on the run, still hiding for the Philistines because the Philistines began to take over the towns in the area and inhabited them for quite a while. I think the story is true about this Amalekite. The Amalekite finished off Saul so that Saul would not linger even after he fell on his own sword or his own spear, whichever is correct. He took the crown, he took the bracelet, and he decided to deliver them to David because he knew David was to be the next king of Israel. Everyone knew that. Even Saul knew it and admitted it. Well, from the discouraging report, we come to David and the distressing regret. Verse number 11. Then David took hold of his clothes and tore them. And so also did all the men who were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and his son Jonathan and for all the people of the Lord and the house of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. Of all that we know about David, how he lived and what he believed, one thing stood out in 1 Samuel. It was David's life standard. It was David's disdain for those who dared to touch the Lord's anointed. Meaning anyone selected by the Lord and anointed to that position by the priest and the prophets and their families were considered the Lord's anointed to David. And throughout the book of 1 Samuel, that standard consumes and hangs over the entire story. Here we find David and his men mourning the death of Saul and his sons. David led the way, and the men followed. 
the way Gad reports the story, the Amalekite must have arrived in the morning before breakfast was served. The news disturbed the clan so much that they did not eat until evening. Now, the way we divide the day, we call evening the late part of the day before midnight. But the Jews did not have the same names for the parts of the day that we do. Their day was morning, evening, and night. We have morning, afternoon, evening, and night. Evening in David's day in the Jewish world began at high noon when the sun started its journey down towards the west, the evening, the falling. When darkness came, it was called night. It wasn't called evening. Therefore, Gad tells us that when the news came of Saul's death, the village did not eat breakfast in the morning, but they did eat their regular meal in the afternoon. After this distressing regret of David and the inhabitants of his village, we come to the disturbing result. Verse 13, David said to the young man who told him, Where are you from? And he answered, I am the son of an alien, an Amalekite. Then David said to him, How is it that you were not afraid to stretch out your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? And David called one of the young men and said, Go, cut him down. So he struck him, and he died. David said to him, Your blood is on your head, for your mouth has testified against you, saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. Perfect example here of how Gad wrote down that uh, this Amalekite was killed and he died. And then he tells us what David told him before he died. Well, even though Saul was a horrible father-in-law to David and an awful king for the nation, still David recognized his anointing as king by the Lord and by Samuel, by the way. And David had at least Two opportunities, if you remember, to kill Saul. Once was in the cave when he cut off the hem of his garment. And once was when he went down when, in the dark of the night when Saul was sleeping very unprotected by his army. And he took Saul's weapon and he took Saul's water jug. Both times, David's men were rejoicing and had said, Hey, the Lord has given Saul into our hands. This is the will of the Lord. But David would not dare touch the Lord's anointed. He would not do it. And he expected no one else to do it either. And no doubt it was still morning when David replied to the Amalekite. And David's standard was set. And he did not need to think about what he wanted to do with this Amalekite. He immediately knew what he would do. And he did it. The Amalekite must die for what he did to Saul, even though Saul may have asked him for help. Had the Amalekite simply brought the crown and bracelet and reported the death without including his part about how he helped kill Saul, David would not have killed this Amalekite. But he did admit it, and David rendered his verdict immediately. In David's mind, no one should ever touch anyone whom the Lord had anointed for a position like this. Well, during the morning, David chanted this disheartening refrain, this song. And we come to the introduction of David's chant, his song in verse number 17. Then David chanted with his lament over Saul and Jonathan, his son. And he told them to teach the sons of Judah, the song of the bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Jasher. The first thing David did after having the Amalekite killed was to do what David always seemed to do. He wrote a song. We call them psalms. And as we moved through 1 Samuel, I presented each psalm of David as he was writing them and presented them in the context of the storyline in which the essence of their context was, was set. And in this case, this psalm is about the death of Saul and Jonathan. After writing the psalm, David sang it to the inhabitants of his village. He used an old melody with this song, and more than likely he had this melody in his mind as he was crafting the words to fit this melody. The melody was called the Song of the Bow. 
Now, if we just take a cursory look at the 150 Psalms, it is very evident that this same melody was used for many of these Psalms. Interestingly, Gad reports that David instructed the people to teach this song to the sons of Judah, not the sons or the nation of Israel. Why? I expect that David sang this song to the inhabitants of his village at that time. And then later, when he was king over Judah, before he became king over Israel, he published the song to the priest and instructed them to teach it to the people he was king over for seven years. Actually, for two years to begin with, and then the rest of the time. Well, now we come to the mention of the book of Jasher. Now, the book of Jasher is mentioned only twice in the Bible, Joshua 10, 13, and here in 2 Samuel 1, 18. In the Joshua passage, we are told how Joshua entreated the Lord in battle uh, with the Amorites, and the Lord caused the sun to stand still at Gibeon until Israel won the battle. What was the book of Jasher? In the Hebrew, just sim simply means the upright, the book of the upright. And it was a record of certain events that occurred in Israel's history yet it was not kept in the care of the priest for protection. This fact means it was viewed as a secular book of Israel and not a religious one. In addition, Joshua was absolutely an upright man and his story deserved to be in a book such as this. And this action of David was upright and deserving of being in a book such as this. And in either, either case, we do not need the book of Jasser because we have that same record here in the Holy Scripture.